Hi everyone, I thought I'd show my face for once for one of these videos. Hopefully I will not embarrass myself too much. We're going to be looking very, very, very briefly about computer looking at computer architecture. And the reason we need to bring that up is because we're going to be talking about how you represent data in a computer immediately afterwards. So this is meant to be a very short, brief overview of hardware. And there's a bad dad joke along the way which explains why we're not going into excruciating detail despite the fact you guys probably need to know more about hardware than I do. So, just as a quick preamble here, FIDA is a Carlton service allowing you, giving you counselor services in case you're having any stresses at university if this is really over the top. I'm not sure if they're running services right now due, due to the whole quarantine thing. But if you are having, you can always check if you're really, uh, if you're stressed out or if you have any problems during the term. And even if you don't use it this year or, in the, or this term, this is a service for you to think about in the future. I know how incredibly hard university life is. We're not going to go easy on you despite knowing how hard it is. But as a sir, as this is a great service in case any of you are particularly stressed about your time. Your professors are regularly worried about how you guys are doing. Uh, despite you know trying to traumatize you with the amount of work we give you, we actually don't want you having a mental breakdown. We want you to learn, and that's why we push you, but it's not because we want, we're, you know, sadistic. So please, if you are in trouble, if you are feeling amounts of stress that are, you know, you're feeling overwhelmed by university, please check this service out. I know I was very, very stressed, especially in my first degree. Um, so, so I just wanted to point that out for you uh, for the future. Okay. Here's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be looking at the history of computers. We're going to look at how CPUs are done. We I think we have a couple basic things in terms of instructions, and then we're going to promptly forget all of it, and I'm going to go and have a shower immediately afterwards to wash all the having to deal with hardware crap off of me. Right? I don't like dealing with hardware. Most programmers don't. We like software. Why? That's because otherwise we do a computer engineering degree. Uh, and so a lot of programmers sort of want it to be a magic box that solves our problems. So we'll look at that, but you do need a certain base knowledge. And then you're going to have other courses that focus on hardware a lot more than I will. Okay, so if you want to know the history of computer science, I could go at, into excruciating details about this one. Um, and we've already talked about, you know, what is a computer? It turns out the idea is fairly old. Now, it stores data, processes data. An adaptable computer doesn't even need to do, doesn't even need to change the program. So, what's called a Turing machine changes can change over time, or could change based on the user input, or the program itself can change. But there are other machines that don't have that particular trait. So, I think I may have a Babbage machine in the next slide. Oh, there is an Abacus, although that's not electronic. It is a way of calculating things. It's still actually being used in many places. It is. It's an amazing, well-designed piece of equipment, especially if you don't have electronics. Uh, I mean, it can represent numbers in the billions, and it allows you to do basic arithmetic. Here's a Babbage machine. There's actually one in the, uh, the history, the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley. Uh, it is absolutely fascinating. The the in the 1800s, I don't think they actually successfully built one. They have built them. Afterwards, after the computer was invented, they go went back to the old uh, blueprints and have made some of these things. Uh, so a Babbage computational machine, you are rotating, uh, you know, you're turning that crank up at the top, and it will help calculate a number. It'll do, you know, polynomials and that sort of thing. But the data, you have to change things manually before you run things again. It will not change depending on user input, for example. It's a mechanical machine. Uh, and then the revolution comes. The Mark I, so the the, the Turing machine, uh, as a theor theoretical mathematical construct, essentially invented by Alan Turing. Um, Alonzo Church also comes up with something very, very similar at the time. But the idea, it was sort of a math experiment, not an actual machine. Now, they end up making a machine try, matching that particular uh, description, but the general idea is you have a piece of tape, you have something that senses what's on the tape, the tape is infinitely long, and you read instructions from the tape and you do 
particular activities uh, on your computer, on your system, depending on what's on the piece of paper. And you can write on the piece of paper as well. And it turns out that you can do, it's actually provably more powerful and you can calculate things that you couldn't do before with like a Babbage machine. That one little change, the ability to, to read an infinitely length tape and then be able to change the tape changes how how we can reason about computation in general. I will not go into the excruciating details for this, but what's interesting is they release what is a computer in the 1940s. Now you'll notice this is using a punch tip tape, which is not them coming up with that on their own. The loom actually uses that. When you have argyle socks or argyle socks back in the day, uh, it is using a loom. It's using a piece of tape that would go over a piece of uh, sort of piece of paper or a bunch of cards, and you'd have pins that go through the paper, and that tells you what pattern to draw on. It's a long-standing notion that then gets used by the U.S. Census in the 1880s, which allows them to actually do the census in a reasonable amount of time. They couldn't do it otherwise. And so there's this long-standing history of how you get to this computer, but what you have with the Mark I is effectively this. This, this is the ENIAC, uh, not the Mark I, but the ENIAC was like 30 tons. It took up the entire rooms. It was massive, and it could do 19,000 floating point operations a second. Pretty much your cell phone absolutely would crush this. Wouldn't even come close. It's not even, it's not even a fair comparison in any way, shape, or form. Yet yeah, this is taking up entire rooms. I found it fascinating. Um, so, why do we need to worry about this? Well, it turns out if you were going to use a machine like this, then you need to be able to encode information. You need to be able to store this data, at least temporarily. And if you're going to store this data temporarily, you how do you do that with a machine? Well, they're using electricity. If you're using electricity, how do you store it? Well, you can store the electricity's there. It's not there. You might try and get cutesy and try and go like, it's half the voltage of available or anything like that, but that's really crappy. That's really hard to read. That's really hard to do. And so what you end up immediately finding is this. The number two is everywhere in computer science. It is ubiquitous. Now you won't see the number two. You'll get a zero or a one, like on this power supply. When it is off, it is a zero. When it is on, it is a one. You can also say a dash and an O, but we zero and one is one way of the, the way to think about it. When you have power to something, the bit is on; otherwise, it's off. You know, otherwise it's off. And you'll find computer scientists when they have something that, and programmers in general, when they have a tool that works, they keep using it until it no longer works. And you will see powers of two and multiples of two everywhere when it comes to programming. So we'll see this when we look at numbers and how we're storing data. So. That's the foreshadowing, things to come. So after that, we have this giant machine that people are working on. And then you get this personal computer where everybody has one of these things in their house and can do computation on their own. And I, I, I talked about it in the very first lecture, but I can't overemphasize how much of a, of a revolution that is. But effectively, it's using the same architecture that we used here. In fact, that's what we're going to briefly talk about, that it's using this, and so is your cell phone. Uh, so we have two different things. We have data and we have instructions. It turns out when they're inventing the first computer, a guy named John van Neumann looks at this and goes, why do they need to be different? Data is data. So we'll put the instructions maybe on one part, but you store it the same way. You do everything the same way, whether it's data, the numbers that you're, you're you know, representing, the, the code you're executing, um, well, it can be the code you're executing, but maybe it's the files you're reading and whatever the case is. And these instructions you're, you're actually executing, they're stored in data. They're, they're just data as well. So you can have one central processing unit, you can have memory, you can have arithmetic, logic un arithmetic and logic unit, and you can have user input, and that's all you really need. So that's one of the three things John von Neumann is going to bring to us this term. Uh, number two, we're going to look at, uh, oh, he gives us two's complement. Uh, I think I said three, right? 
He also gives us the policy of mutually assured destruction, which, so he wasn't a complete angel in this respect. Uh, the reason the U.S. and the USSR had such large nuclear arsenals, he was actually one of the big advocates and and sort of advocated to the president to have a larger and larger nuclear arsenal to make sure that there, you wouldn't have a nuclear war. Um, interesting guy, let's say. I'm pretty sure there's probably something... Oh, the, and then we're going to have one more thing, which is the von Neumann architecture, which we're going to see now. So, here is the CPU, or the reason we're doing a video at all, this. Hopefully you can see it. This is a $35 at the time, and this is six years old, $35 CPU or, or full-blown uh, board. This is a Raspberry Pi. It has a CPU on it. It's going to have memory, which is actually going to be this thing here, I think, uh, for the time being. It's actually using the flash memory to as its actual internal memory. Uh, and it has inputs and outputs via the USB and an HDMI port. It is the same thing that we're seeing here. It's the same thing that they came up in the 1940s. The architecture, although you may have more cores, and some of it's changed, the general policy is, or the general approach, has has been, and it's deviating from that now, but the general approach has been, take some instructions, execute it, take the next set of instructions, execute it, go sequentially through the instructions on your in your code, and execute them, and that's different than how our brain works. It's different how a lot of than how a lot of things work. Our brains work in parallel. It's a parallel associative memory structure. A CPU and a computer in general has a different approach. So I'd like to point out that here's my very, very, very bad dad joke. Uh, so <clears throat> how many computer scientists does it take to uh, screw in a light bulb? None. It's a hardware problem. Yeah, terrible. OK, but the reason I like to point out that ridiculously bad joke is it states sort of how when you talk to people that are programming or when you're programming one of the best things to do is just pretend it's a magic box that does all the work for you because if you start worrying about oh the the electron uh, the electrons going down that wire are going to be degraded and therefore my code won't execute correctly it is you'll be driven mad so what we want is a magic box that does stuff but every once in a while you need to know how instructions are being executed. You'll do it in a lot more detail when you do when you do assembly, but for the time being, we're just going to go over some basics. So we have registers that hold the data that you're going to process. We have an arithmetic logic unit, or the ALU. It's now part of the CPU, uh, and this thing will actually crunch the numbers. It will add two numbers together, for example, or it will um, or it will do an AND between two numbers or two sets of uh, two words of data, let's say. Um, and so you're executing the code through the ALU. The von Neumann architecture gives you that, and it's being used everywhere. It's changed a little bit, but not. it's ridiculously resistant. That 1945, and we're still using it today, including two's complement as well, which we'll get to later. Uh, so instead of the ALU and the control unit, it is now one thing. But we still have memory, we still have I.O. So here's the original approach. The new approach is combine those two together. But we take memory, we bring it into the central, we bring it to the CPU or uh, into the CPU or the control unit ALU. We have input from and output uh, input from the user that goes into the CPU and is dealt with by the CPU. Or it might be outputting image an image to the screen that goes through output from the CPU to the output. It is a very simple architecture, but it works and it's not, it is amazingly effective at what it does. Okay, so what we're going to get to very, very soon, I want to give you a preamble of things to come, is we're going to be looking at a couple languages. We're going to finally start programming in C, thankfully. Uh, and what I want to make sure you we point out before we get into that is unlike English or French or any number of other languages, the you know the language that you speak is part of your identity for many many people. A programming language should not really be part of your identity. Some it probably is for some people, but they're tools for you to use. And so if 
Python is a better tool, go switch to Python. If C is a better tool, go switch to C. We are teaching C, but not because it is the only language available. And it's you shouldn't be thinking that you're not going to learn another language in your in the future. They are tools, and this is a, we are using it to explain how to program to you. But that does not mean that we're going to be you know that you're never going to learn another language or that C is the best language ever. It is just a language. It just happens to be a very useful language that is, you know, in demand with industry. So here is what we know our normal uh, programming languages. Notice visual programming is not listed in there. Technically, it's an interpreted language. So like scratch, but binary code we can't do not human readable machine code, eh, not really readable either. Right? It's binary code run by the operating system. It's in hexadecimal. We'll talk about hexadecimal, but really, we don't read that either. Assembly. We still don't want to read that. I'd rather poke my eyes out than read assembly all day, every day. It is painfully hard. At least it is for me. And then we have what's called the compiled languages. These are mid-level languages. C is the sort of the lowest, the most down-to-the-wire uh, of those languages. But they're compiled languages where you take your code, you take what you wrote, you convert it to machine code, you convert it to binary essentially, and then the machine reads it. And you don't do any of that conversion. As long as it's a one-to-one -one mapping between one to the other, you can just magically assume it works. One level above that is scripted and interpreted languages. These are things like Python, uh, Java is an interpreted language technically, JavaScript is a scripting language. These things are you take an instruction, it then goes into an interpreter, the interpreter then converts it to code, which then goes, like, it's more and, more and more levels of abstraction. And it means you can, it can lead to more confusion as well, or more problems or more bugs, it, theoretically. Uh, so here's essentially what's going to go on in our machine, and for machine code, if you want, if you wanted to get the, the lowdown. So we're going to take eight bits of numbers. So this would be these eight numbers across 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's eight bits. Eight on and off switches, eight light switches, if you will. That's going to represent one number, let's say. That is 80 in hex, in case you're wondering or you're trying to keep up. Uh, or is it? I'll have to look at that again, just in case it's not. And, um, yeah, this doesn't look great. Anyways. We're going to we're going to pretend it's 80 in hex. We're going to take the uh, next another number, and that's the value one. And then we are going to have a particular instruction, and uh, or that would actually that's just going to be another hexadecimal number. I'm going to look at the instructions in a sem in a second. Here's the assembly language. We're going to take machine elements, replace it with an English representation, approximately, and it'll be something like add to register a this particular value. That's what this thing. Add this to that. It is extremely hard to read. We're not going to be talking about it in this course. I'm not going to be asking about any of this on the exam, in case you're wondering. It is just the general idea of what's going on. I might move the contents from register B to the contents of register A. I might add this value here to F00, this hexadecimal value, over to register A. I might add what is in register C to whatever the case is. Uh, pretty much the moment we have assembly, we go, oh, thankfully, it's so much better than writing binary. Oh my god, let's stop doing this. Right? Some people still write assembly, but it's really hard to do, and it's impossible to make large code, large code bases with it. We need a better way. We need a higher language, but it's still critically important to know how the data is being stored in the system for you to know how, how the computer is working. Because if you don't know that, you're going to have a really hard time figuring out what's going wrong with your code. You need to actually be able to look at the actual data itself. So high-level languages in general, we have less freedom. You have to write your code a particular way. You can't do ghost to statements. You shouldn't do go to statements. And you can have more complexity. Python has libraries upon libraries upon libraries of things you can do. You may never use, but you can do it. You can read XML or you can read uh, JSON files natively, right? You just include something, you run it, and you can include and read a JSON file without having to write all the code yourself. But it means you're constrained to how wh whoever wrote that library uses that library. Um, 
However, it does make the code more readable. So we're taking that halfway point with C. But effectively, for us, we are going to go from this, which is what we're going to write, the if animal is dog, bark, right? If I have some kind of function, uh, some kind of condition or some C code, I will take that, it will convert that text. All we're writing is text. You can write it in a text editor for all I care. That will then go through a compiler, which will then convert all of that to machine code. And it's a, because there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the two of them, I can write an algorithm as a human-readable format, convert it to machine-readable format, and then the machine can actually run the code. That's what we're doing in C. And that's actually why when you compile things, just because it compiles doesn't mean it's right, but one of the big problems when you're learning C is getting it to compile can be a challenge because if there's any mistakes anywhere along the way, if you it's like having a spelling mistake in an English essay and then not being able to write your, your assignment. Right? If you were not able to pass in a piece in your in a document simply because you had a spelling mistake somewhere in the document, that would be challenging. That's one of the challenges with using most programming languages, is if you're compiling it or even if you're interpreting it, that act of compilation or interpretation uh, means that if you have any mistakes along the way, you're sort of screwed. So you have to go a little bit at a time. You can't write everything all at once. That's why you do it a little bit at a time. Okay, so of the compiling languages, we're going to be looking at C, and it's going to go to binary code afterwards. And when we come back next time around, we're going to be looking at how data is actually stored in, uh, on the computer. And we're going to look at binary, we're going to look at hex, and we're going to look at two's complement, we're going to look at floating point numbers very, very briefly. And the reason we're looking at that is not because I'm going to be, you know, I, I want to make you suffer and worry about numbers all day. It's because when you're actually trying to debug your code, you will be forced to look at it because it won't make sense otherwise. We have to look at how it's being stored on the system. So with that being said, I'll take my leave of you and uh, hopefully talk, you'll see the next video soon. Thanks.